This training video is going to cover receipts using the USAS Web Receipts Interface and also Reduction of Expenditures, the Refund Interface in USAS Web, and ARF, the Accounts Receivable Facility. So first off, we're going to talk about processing a receipt. That's basically putting money in that has been received by the district um, and, and receiving it into a revenue account, which then also updates the related cash account. Examples, daily cafeteria receipts, student fees, tuition payments, things like that. When posting a receipt, it's going to create a record on the receipt.idx file. So when you think about those index files that are listed in a district's directory, there is going to be a record created for each line item of the receipt. So if you do a five item receipt, um, there's going to be five different records created. Also on the account.idx file, it's going to update the revenue and cash accounts. So the month, fiscal, and year to date actual received amounts on the revenue account will be increased and the remaining receivable, what the district still anticipates receiving, is going to be decreased. On the cash account month fiscal and year to date receipt amounts, as well as the cash fund balance and available cash balance will be increased. Here's an example of a before and after when posting receipt and how it affects the account. So looking at this particular 006 uh, revenue account, um, a $30 receipt was processed. So before, there was $154.75. And after, it's now $184, so $30. And it not only increases the fiscal, also the month and the calendar. So because I have receded in and increased my revenue, I now anticipate receiving less. So my remaining balance has decreased by 30. And on the related cash account, my um, receipt amount for fiscal, month, and calendar have also increased by $30, thus also increasing my remaining balance and my available balance. So before we get into a refund of receipt, let's, let me take you through posting a receipt in USAS Web. So I'm going to go to Receipts and New. And I'm going to go ahead and put in, I'm going to let it default, and I'm in June period here. I'm going to say from Sue Smith, who's the cafeteria manager, and let's see, receipts for about cafeteria receipts from 625. And $100. And my type is receipts, so I'm just going to default past that. Student type A. And I know it's 006. I don't know the rest of it, so I'm going to use my binoculars. Type A lunch. I'm going to add another one for $50 for student a la carte. And it's going to be a different receipt number. A la carte sales, 1513. And I'll do one more for milk. That's a different receipt number as well. Still the same fund. So when I actually go in and validate these three, um, basically each of these account codes, this one's going to be increased by 100, this one by 50, and this one by 10. And the total $160 is also going to be increased on the related cash account, which is my 006 all zeros. I'm going to go ahead and validate and post this. And you'll notice too with receipts, I could go back in and modify this, but there's only specific things an end user can modify. They can go in and modify the receipt number, the date, as long as it's within the same uh, processing month, uh, the receipt from a description, and the description on the account. They can't go in and modify a receipt in Classic and change the amount. They have to do either a negative receipt, a refund, in order to make a change. Um, or doing a reverse. If I enter and select the reverse option, it'll allow me to reverse out 
a particular item and make the update there. Clone will allow me to take the data from this particular receipt and copy it to a new receipt, and then print will allow me to print the receipt. So I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint, and the next thing we're going to talk about is a refund of receipt. So this is basically um, either used to undo a receipt. So again, if I had posted something incorrectly, a wrong amount, and I wanted to um, reverse that, I could use the reverse option, or I could do um, a refund of receipt to back that re original receipt out. Another thing that refunds use is to refund money to a vendor. So if the refund warrants payment to a vendor, um, the end user can create a refund check that may be sent to that vendor. So if a student overpays for their fees, um, the district can issue a refund check. So with a refund of receipt, again, it's going to create a record on that receipt.edx file for each item of the refund. And then on the actual account file for that revenue account, the month, fiscal, and year-to-date actual received amounts are decreased. I'm refunding the money, so I'm reducing the received amount. And because I'm reducing the received amount, I'm increasing my anticipated revenue, what I still expect to receive. On the related cash account, month, fiscal, and year-to-date receipts amounts, as well as the fund balance and the available balance are all decreased. I'm refunding money. So I'm reducing what was available um, in that revenue in that receipt account. Here is a before and after. So I had uh, $30 that I refunded. So this is what I had, 184 After the refund, I now have 154 I reduced my received amount, thus increasing my anticipated remaining amount, what I still think I'm going to receive for that account. On the cash account, I had 40, 62, 50. Well, I did a refund, so now it's less, so everything is decreased. My receipt amount, my balance, and my available cash balance. So if I go back and do a refund. I'm going down to the refund option, and I'm clicking on new. And I'm going to go ahead, let that auto assign, and my date. And I'm going to say yes, because I'm going to create a refund with check. And so the check number, I'm going to go ahead and just type in the next available check number going to be the same date as my refund date. And the vendor is it's going to be refunded to Sam Samplement for overpayment of fees. I go ahead and put in my amount and it was $20. Go ahead and put in the account code. And I'm going to go ahead and validate this. And it tells me that the validation is successful. And I'm going to go ahead and post this. And so it's telling me that here's my refund transaction, $20, and then my check. So with USAS Web, you can't print a check from here. I could print the refund. So this print option will allow me to print the refund transaction. But in order to print the check, I have to go into the VMS side and to check sequence, option two, and generate a print file. Um, I would put this uh, check number in as the beginning and ending check number, and I'll get a file then that I could print off or print through a third-party printing software. If I wanted to modify this refund, there's not a lot I can modify. I could go in, change the refund number, the date, as long as it's within the same period, and probably the description, I think. Um, but everything else, I can't go in and make changes to the amount or to the vendor or anything like that. 
um, clone. This will allow me to clone a refund into a new one. And obviously the print, like I said, will allow me to print the refund, 181125, to generate a print file of the refund. So a reduction of expenditure um, is, is an option, instead of issuing a receipt, if the money coming in is paying back a previously made expenditure, you can do a reduction of expenditure. So a reduction of expenditure may also be used to correct expenditures posted incorrectly. If I went in and accidentally posted $50 to the wrong account, I could go into the refund um, or reduction of expenditure, I'm sorry, go into the reduction of expenditure, do a reduction to that incorrect account, and then on the second line of that transaction, post it to the account it should have gone to by doing a negative reduction of expenditure. That's basically an account correction. So let me go in. Um, with a reduction of expenditure, you've got a couple different things going on. First off, it's going to create a record, just like a refund and a receipt, to the receipt.idx file for each reduction of expenditure item entered. And then on the account file, now you're talking cash appropriation and budget accounts. You're doing a reduction of expenditure that's on an expenditure account. So your budget and appropriation accounts, fiscal, month, and year-to-date actual expended amounts are decreased. You're doing a reduction of expenditure, reducing the expenditure, so you're decreasing that. The budget and appropriation accounts unencumbered balance then is increased. And then on the related cash account, month fiscal and year-to-date expended amounts are decreased. And the fund balance and available cash balance are increased. You reduced the expenditures, now you have more cash to spend. So I will take you through an example of creating a reduction of expenditure. So again, this falls underneath the receipt option in USAS Web. So I'm going to click on New, let that go, and it's going to be a reduction of expenditure. So and this is from Go ahead and put in the amount. And here I'm going to type in just an R again to get reduction of expenditure. And you noticed my account code dimensions all changed to accommodate a budget account. And this is my transportation. So go ahead and put in the account code. So this account code that I'm entering in, I had a previous expenditure made to this account. And now what I'm doing is I'm reducing the expended amount out of this account by $100. I'll go ahead and validate this. Oh, forgot my... Go ahead and edit this here. Got the wrong one. be at 2800 because it has to do with transportation and it's a salary. And I'll go ahead and find that. Go ahead and add that. So I'm going to be reducing an expended amount from this account. So it's previously expended. I'll go ahead and validate this and post. And these next couple slides just talk about how to create a receipt, search for an account, the different icons that are involved in any of the USAS web um, uh, options here. So a lot of these fall in with purchase orders and um, receipts and refunds and, and all of that. So a similar type of icons. 
So the next thing I want to get into is ARF. And so this is an entirely separate system. So this is what was part of the barnyard programs um, that were created several years ago. And the difference between USAS Web Receipts and ARF is that ARF has a billing, whereas USAS Web does not. So USAS Web is just a straight receipt. Where in here, ARF has a billing that allows you to create a billing or an invoice um, and then it's got a payment system then. When that payment's been received, um, then the district can receive it in. So a receipt can be posted and a reduction of expenditure can be posted as well. There is no refund option in ARF. It's either receipt or reduction of expenditure. And these are some of the practical uses of ARF, different things that can be on here. And then these are the different processing options that are available in ARF. You can create an invoice, and that's called a billing. You can record a payment on one or more of those invoices, that's called a payment. Or you can do those two options at the same time. You can do a billing payment, which will create the invoice and post the payment simultaneously. You also have a payment receipt option. So with these options, billing, payment, and billing slash payment, you are affecting ARF. You are not affecting the receipt.idx file. So with ARF, you've got um, an AR.idx file, an ARCUST.idx file, and those will get affected, but the receipt.idx file does not get affected until you have one of these receipt options involved. So for the payment receipt, this is the same as the payment option, but it also does the additional step of posting the receipt to USAS. So like I said, before these were affecting ARF records only. Once I have a payment receipt and I have a receipt involved, then I'm affecting USAS, meaning the receipt.idx file and the account.idx file. So I have to have a billing entered in before I can use payment receipt. Just like with payment, I can't record a payment unless a billing exists. So this last option, billing payment receipt, basically is taking care of this one and this option all at once. So it's going to create the billing, post the payment in ARF, and the receipt to USAS all in one step. With ARF, there are required prefixes that need to go in there, and one of them is an invoice ledger code. So when it comes to that billing, you need to have a one to four character code used with an invoice number to define groups of invoices. So you might have a group of invoices for your board um, information. You might have another group of invoices for a different part of your district. Um, so um, here's an example. Um, you could have one for student type of payments or receipts, one for different buildings like your elementary, one for different departments like cafeteria. Um, so you have to have an invoice ledger created first before you can create a billing. Customer numbers. You can create separate customers just for ARF. If you don't want to create separate customers for ARF, you can use vendors in USAS. So when you are assigning a customer or a, or a vendor, you need to use one of the unique codes. So C would stand for ARF customer. So if I had an ARF customer 100, I would have to enter in C100. If I want to use one of my existing vendors in USAS, let's say I already have um, you know, something already entered in for maybe a parent or something like that. I'm billing for preschool fees. And so I already have the parent in as a vendor in USAS. I just have to type in a V and then the vendor number and it will be applied to that particular person. There's also E for employee SSNs that looks at the USPS employee file and S for student information. 
So uh, you do need a ledger code and you do need a customer code. This is an optional one. There's also a receipt code that you could put in as well. And this is a one to three character code used with a receipt number to define a local receipt. So it could be a person's initials. So if you're a district that's wanting to track who's entering in this information, maybe it's um, the high school secretary, and you want to track when she's recording stuff in ARF, you could put her initials in as a receipt code so that um, it defines the ones that she's entering in. So before we get into the ARF reports, I'm going to take you into ARF and show you an example of a receipt. Now, mind you, ARF could be a two to three hour session in and of itself. And we do have an ARF training manual um, that, would, that goes over this in detail. Um, so this is a very abbreviated version of ARF. If this is something where you feel you need to have more training in ARF, you can email the SSDT um, and let us know um, if you're interested in um, having um, a more um, detailed training in ARF. Right now, basically, this video is just going to be a brief introduction into the ARF program. So let me go back, and I need to pull up, this is all on the VMS side of things here. So I'm going to go ahead and type in ARF. And so <clears throat> the first thing, like I said, it's going to take you into is the actual ARF menu. Is this a billing? Is this a payment? A billing payment, a payment receipt, or a billing payment receipt? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to create just a regular billing. So I'm going to go ahead and type that in, select that. And then I get these options in here. Do I want to erase after post or save after post? So basically what this means is if this is where I was entering in a batch of billings and all of the information was the same, so let's say I was going in and doing a bunch of preschool uh, billings. Um, so really the only thing that's changing is the customer. Otherwise, the description, the date, everything else is the same. What I could do to save myself time is to say save after posting, and that's going to save the detail information that I'm going to enter down here on this first one. So basically when I start my next billing, all of that detailed information will already be in there, so I don't have to type it over again. So if I know that each billing is going to be entirely separate information, I would select erased after posting so that it wipes out what's in this detail and lets me start from fresh. So I'm going to go ahead and select save after posting. Now I have printing options. Do I want basically an output file of my billing? So I could say no here, or I could say billing output written. So I don't think that third one's really actively used much anymore. So I'm going to select billing output written, and it's going to ask me for a batch number. So by default, it's going to give me an ARF bill 001.txt. Now if I want to change that, make it different, I could do that. Um, so I'm going to just put in 101, and basically I'm going to get an ARF bill 101.txt file when I'm done. And ARF, as long as I'm, um, when I, if I log out to ARF, I go back in, um, it should be smart enough to remember that 101, and it could automatically sign a 102 for my next round of, of ARF invoices that I want to print. So basically, I've set up um, my ARF billing output file. And I've also set this up that after I post this invoice that I'm going to um, enter in here, it'll save the details. So the next thing I need is an invoice ledger code. That was one of the ones that is required. I have to have an invoice ledger code already set up. And I do for sample schools. So that invoice ledger code has to be from one to four digits. Mine's just two, SS. And then I have to have up to a five-digit number with that. And I'm going to go ahead and just use 100. And so I don't get any type of message up here or anything that that invoice or billing number is already on file, so I'm good. And I'm going to put in my date. And then my customer. 
That's where I was saying I have to denote it with a C or a V, depending on if I'm going to use an ARF customer, which is a C, or a USAS vendor. And I'm going to go ahead and just tick on a USAS vendor here. And so I'm going to use that SAM um, sampleman. And so at this point then, if I had a comment that I wanted to make, maybe preschool um, for May, or something like that, I could put that in here if I wanted to. If I don't, that information can also be pulled into the description. So I've got what is required of me, an invoice number, a date, and a customer. So at this point, I'm going to look at my menu up here. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use PF2 then to go to my item information. That's my toggle key. So that's going to clear. And it's going to remember when I entered in that, pri in that prior screen. And now it's going to allow me to go in and enter the details about this. So the service date, oops, 18. And then if I had a customer reference, which this is just an optional field that the district can use, I don't have anything. My description though, preschool fees for May. And the amount was $100. And now it's looking for the revenue count that it needs to be receded into. So I'm sending this invoice to a parent saying, you owe me $100 for preschool fees for the month of May. And so I'm going to have to go in and put that in. I forgot my OPU, so I'm just typing in all zeros till I get to the OPU. There we go. And it does give me some information up here. Um, so. Um, to let me know if I have the correct account. Now, if I had another item to add, I would go in and add that and keep adding all my items, but this is the only one I have, so I'm going to go ahead and post this. So I'm going to use that PF1 key to post it. And so um, my billing has been posted. So at this point then, um, I'm done with the billing, and when that, and then I send the billing out, so I'm going to go ahead and hit, I can either do F10 to get out of here, or I can use my PF4, which is the hyphen key on your keypad, and I could go to exit ARF. F10 or exit ARF will do the same thing. And I'm going to get $100, and I'm going to get a summary, and also I'm going to have a billing output file. One oh one, remember that's the number I entered in, and it's going to bring up the information. So preschool fees. So this is the billing then that I can send to that customer. And so once the money comes in from the customer, I want to make a payment to it. Now before I do that, you can use in EIEIO there is a bark option. So I'm going to go ahead and um, type that in. And it's the bark option up here. And this will give me an overview of where I'm at with that billing. So I want to go down to the invoice, and it was SS100. And it tells me right now that right now I have a $100 balance against that invoice. And here are the details of the invoice. So it was $100, this is a person, the end user that created it, and the date and time. This is the description information. And so in my totals, I see right now that it was $100 billed, which is $100 net, nothing paid. So I still have, I have $100 outstanding against this invoice. So if I made multiple um, payments against this invoice, I could see all of that using the Spark option. I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, exit out of here. And now I've got the money from the, or the, 
parent. So I'm going to go ahead and make the payment against this. I'm going to go back into ARF. And I could select the payment option, but it's not going to record the payment in USAS. So if a district says, I want somebody from the building, like the high school or elementary secretary, to do the billing and the payment, and then they could run some ARF reports to give them the totals that were entered in, but then somebody in the treasurer's office has to go in and post the receipt into USAS if they're using just the billing option. If this user is allowed to go in and make the payment into USAS, then instead of billing, they could use billing receipt. So if you've got somebody using just billing payment, billing payment, it's going to record the billing and the payment in ARF, but it will not create a receipt in USAS. If you're going to allow that person to make receipt postings in USAS, they're going to use the billing option and then payment receipt to record it into USAS. So that's what I'm going to choose. And I get those same type of prompts billing output, payment uh, print options, do I want an output file for the payment? So this is the receipt that's going to go to the customer. And I can put in a batch file name again, put 101. And then this is the receipt. So this is the USAS receipt. Do you want that output file as well? Yes. And so the first thing it's going to ask me for is that actual invoice number which was SS100, and so it's going to bring up the information about that. And so my date is 6.30, and if I received a check from the parent, I could put the check number in here, and I could put in a comment, a pay comment if I wanted to, and then this is the next available receipt transaction number. So I'm just going to let it default to the next one. And then from here then, I have to use PF2 to go to my actual payment information. And it knows that I still have $100 left. Um, and so if I wanted to pay off the entire $100, um, receive that in, I would go ahead and just leave it as 100. If I only received maybe $50 right now from the parent, I would overwrite that and put 50. My billing then would still be outstanding because I still have $50 um, yet that I'm planning on receiving in from this parent. So, but I'm going to do the whole 100. So at this point, there's really not much more for me to do except press PF1 to post. So now, when I exit out of here, I'm going to show one payment and one receipt for a total of $100. I have an ARF pay. And this is the receipt I would give to that parent, to Sam Sampleman. And then I also have a receipt form. And this is the actual receipt then. So if I don't print it off from ARF, I could also go into USAS Web, into the receipt option, query that receipt, which is right here, 181127, and print off the receipt from there as well. And the last thing I could do is go back into EIEIO, into that BARC option, and do a search on that invoice again. So now I'm going to see that the summary balance is zero. So here is my original invoice information. Now here is my payment information. I paid $100. This was my receipt number. This was my USAS transaction number. 100 billed, 100 paid, nothing left. That billing is no longer outstanding. Also with ARF, are a series of reports and it has all the information in here and all of these are recorded 
in the USAS manual as well, in the reference manual. So these are all just the various reports that you can get from using the ARF program. The ARH is going to be a listing of accounts receivable with outstanding balances. So if you want to see what's still outstanding from 30 days ago, 60 days, 90 days, you can use the ARH report. The AR state is a statement. So if a customer calls and says, what do I have outstanding with you? You can generate an AR state report for just them and it will um, detail all of the outstanding invoices that they have. The AR sum, the AR tran, and the AR detail are just summary and detailed transaction reports of your various ARF um, invoices or payments. There is also an AR um, receivable report that can be used for gap reporting. And there are four UDMS-based ARF reports. If you want a listing of all of your invoice, ledger, um, invoice ledgers, you're not quite sure what all is out there, the ledge list will give you that information. If you want a listing of all your ARF customers, the cusp list will give you that information. Okay, well that completes the training video for receipts, refunds, reduction of expenditures, and ARF. Thank you.